I'm Sheila Briner, your infection and preventionist here at Logan Sport Memorial Hospital. And today we're going to talk about vaccines and illness. So specifically influenza, pneumovax, pneumonia, and COVID and COVID vaccines. As you'll see by the slides, we're going to have um, a discussion first about influenza and the vaccination for influenza. Um, the flu vaccine has been um, recommended by the CDC for everyone six months and older. Flu season starts this year in October and goes through March, which that's standard every year. Um, and just so you know, when you get your vaccine, it's gonna take two weeks before it's active and effective. So that means that it's during those two weeks, it's building up immunity for your system so that you will uh, be resistant to the flu in two weeks. FYI, last year, there was 193.8 million doses of influenza vaccines distributed, which is record-breaking. Um, and preliminary numbers indicate that more than 50% of adults got vaccinated last year. The benefits of influenza vaccine, why get them? Uh, flu vaccines help reduce hospitalizations, especially for those people that are more high risk, uh, like people that have lung disease, diabetes, and have had previous cardiac arrest. During 2019, 2020, the vaccination prevented an estimated 105,000 flu-related hospitalizations and 3.69 million doctor visits. That means hopefully you will visit the doctor less. Flu vaccines reduce the risk of flu-associated hospitalizations for adults by 40% and helped keep them from the ICU by 82%. That's a lot of prevention. The risks of the vaccine include side effects like soreness, redness at the arm, swelling at the site. You could have a low grade fever, headaches, uh, muscle aches. Those are normal reactions to a vaccine. So your reportable side effects, things you wanna call the doctor about, include if you have dizziness, vision changes or ringing in the ears. Understand there's always a risk that the flu vaccine that is uh, created for this year's flu season may not be as effective against the virus that is active at the time. So let's talk about myths about influenza vaccines. There's lots of myths over the course of years. I just picked a couple that were most predominant um, including that the flu vaccine gives me the flu. That is impossible as if you get an injection, the flu vaccine is not a live virus. Secondly, then people say, well, I don't feel good when I get the flu vaccine. I got the flu after I got the vaccine. So what really happens when you get the flu after the vaccine is because you are already infected with the flu virus when you got the vaccine. Your body was already fighting the flu virus and consequently the vaccine didn't have time to take effect before you were sick. Pneumovax. So everyone wants to prevent pneumonia. So you wanna get your pneumovax, especially as we continue to age. So the pneumovax which has been traditional, what we've always known about a, a pneumonia shot, um, is called the Pneumovax 23. That's the one that prevents 23 different strains of pneumococcal bacteria. And the CDC recommends that for all adults 65 and over and people under 65 if they have certain medical conditions, which your doctor can discuss with you. The Prevnar is a fairly new vaccine and that um, protects against the 13 most common strains of pneumococcal bacteria. The CDC recommends the Prevnar 13 for adults 65 and older if their doc recommends it and for younger people depending on their situations, including children younger than two. The Prevnar has actually been found, the new Prevnar, in 1998 
when it was started, they had a huge drop in pneumococcal disease in 2002, directly attributable to the Prevnar 13. So that's a benefit to actually taking the, the Prevnar and the pneumovax. So they're gonna protect you against pneumonia, um, antibiotic resistant pneumococcal infection. The risks are gonna be the same as any other vaccine like the flu, side effects are the same. Soreness at the site, muscle aches, redness at the site, uh, low grade fever, headaches and muscle aches. And again, reportable reactions, things you wanna call the doctor about. Dizziness, vision changes, and ringing in the ears. Now we're gonna talk about COVID. Everybody loves COVID. So a little background on COVID here at the hospital, um, just to kind of refresh, just let's just walk down memory lane. The first US case of COVID-19 was last year, January 21st. And lots has happened since then. March 11th, it was declared a pandemic. And March 23rd, we actually had our first case in Cass County. And since then, we've all changed and evolved how we handle uh, different scenarios that we never thought we would have to deal with. For example, everyone wearing masks. Um, the respiratory clinic on March 25th was started at the Penman building and eventually went to the 4-H fairgrounds for testing. And then on April 14th, we had a dedicated D-wing here at the hospital that was strictly for COVID patients that were ill. So I just want to remind you what the signs and symptoms are of COVID. They include fever and chills, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, loss of taste and smell, shortness of breath, coughing, congestion, sore throat, and headaches, muscle fatigues. If you have those and you feel that you are um, need medical care, you need to come to the ER. There's also, um, otherwise you can go to your primary care doctor and we're gonna talk about some treatments here um, about the COVID specific. So just in general, treatment of influenza and COVID are similar. You're gonna treat the symptoms. So avoid contact with others. This means we're not going to the movie theater, we're gonna stay home. Uh, make sure you drink plenty of fluids and get rest. Take Tylenol for fevers and muscle aches as long as your doctor says you can. And you can always rotate with ibuprofen. Make sure that you're wiping high touch areas down with bleach water or uh, disinfectant wipe. Make sure you wash your hands frequently and cover your mouth when coughing or sneezing. And best not to touch your face. And of course, again, if it's critical, seek emergency care. If you must leave the house, please wear a mask. Try to avoid seeing anybody else until you're at least 24 hours fever free. Therefore, if you can isolate in the house from your other family members, that's optimal. COVID-19, if you have COVID-19, it's isolation for a total of 10 days from the first day of symptom and you have to be fever free for at least 24 hours with no medicine to help with that fever. If you have an influenza patient, so if you're sick with the flu, it's 24 hours with no fever and no fever reducing medicine before you can return to work, school, or your normal functions. So medical treatment, let's talk about medical treatment of influenza and COVID. So for a flu patient, a doctor can prescribe an antiviral if he sees it is appropriate. For the COVID patients, we have outpatient treatment and we have inpatient treatment here at LMH. So if you're an inpatient, we have several different potential treatments and that's gonna be dependent on your um, health condition and situation. Those specific medications are gonna be dependent on approval from the FDA, whether it's an emergency use authorization or full FDA approval. If you're an outpatient, you can receive treatments to as a prophylactic for certain high risk patients who have been exposed or as a treatment if you are positive. You must see your doctor to get that order 
and then you would come up here to the hospital as an outpatient to the outpatient infusion clinic to receive treatment. These treatments are going to help reduce symptoms. They are not going to cure COVID. So how does the COVID-19 vaccine work? So if we get the vaccine, that's going to reduce the risk of us being seriously ill with COVID. It may not stop us from actually getting COVID. So it's going to reduce the symptoms, hopefully reduce you from, prevent you from coming into the hospital. Um, and it's probably not going to stop transmission. So if you get the vaccine and you get COVID and don't realize you have COVID, you could share that illness with another person that's not vaccinated. So the actual COVID vaccine creates an antibody immune response by creating spike proteins on the cells. And you'll notice if you look at the picture, the little red fluff balls are the actual spike proteins. So the body recognizes these cells as invaders and begins making the antibodies to prevent you from getting seriously ill from COVID. Understand when you get the COVID vaccine, if you get Moderna or Pfizer, you're gonna get two shots. Otherwise, Johnson & Johnson is a one shot. I know that they're discussing a booster shots this year. We don't have any information at this point at LMH, and as soon as we do, we will share that information with our patients and staff. So that includes what, who can get the vaccine, what we're gonna do, what the process is. So can I get the COVID vaccine? If you have not already received the COVID vaccine, absolutely you can get the COVID vaccine as long as your doctor approves if you have certain medical situations. If you have an anaphylactic re reaction to medication, you need to talk to your doctor before you get the vaccine. And if they, the CDC recommends that if you have had an anaphylactic reaction to other vaccinations, you should not get the COVID vaccine. If you've been exposed to somebody with COVID, you need to wait 90 days until, or if you've been positive for COVID, you need to wait 90 days until you can get your vaccine. So after the vaccine, you need to make sure that you continue to wear your mask when you're out in public to help prevent transmission of the COVID. The potential side effects are the same as the flu vaccine. You're gonna treat the symptoms, the, the muscle aches, that kind of stuff. It's 95% eff efficacy, which means that your Pfizer and Moderna are 95% effective after the two weeks, after your second shot, two weeks after your second shot, it is 95% effective against the COVID virus. So let's talk about some myths. So many people think that the vaccine, the COVID vaccine was created very quickly and justifiably so, but the reason it was so quick for a couple things, number one, uh, all the companies were working together to create a vaccine that was going to hopefully reduce the symptoms, if not cure COVID. Right now we have a vaccine that is going to reduce the symptoms. The FDA pushed the information through quickly. And finally, they've actually had the mRNA vaccine created from the 70s, but they have not used it in that method until recently with the COVID vaccine. Therefore, we already had the science behind the vaccine. We just hadn't applied it and we applied it to the COVID vaccine. Nick Smith, the COVID-19 vaccine can alter my DNA. It does not alter your DNA. It sends out the mRNA, delivers instructions to your cells to tell them, hey, this is a, this is a virus and this is bad. This is just like your immune system sending out information to say that the cold you're getting is bad and therefore trying to get rid of it. 
Um, the COVID-19 vaccine can make me sick. So none of the authorized COVID-19 vaccines in the United States contain live virus. Therefore, they cannot make you sick. It is the same as the influenza vaccine. So last thing we're gonna discuss about the COVID-19 vaccine includes serious adverse reactions. So listed here, first of all, what's a serious adverse reaction? That includes, the FDA lists that as a death, hospitalization because you got the vaccine, or prolonged hospitalization because you had, if you were already in the hospital, life-threatening reaction, or a disability or permanent damage to your body, to your activities, or to your quality of life. Having said that, the percentages for Pfizer, patients, the, the trial period, they want patients to report any kind of adverse, serious adverse reactions, hospitals report, um, doctor's offices report if they have a patient that has these kind of reactions. And we had with Pfizer 0.4% reported serious adverse reactions. The placebo patients, which are the patients that did not get the vaccine, but don't know that they didn't get the vaccine, reported 0.3% serious adverse reactions. So minimal difference there. Um, on Moderna, they had 1% of the COVID vaccinated patients report serious adverse reactions and 1% of the placebo patients report adverse reactions. Again, equal. The only statistic I found on the J&J &J vaccine was that six female patients out of 6.8 million doses given ended up with cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, which you hear talk about blood clots. So that's one patient out of a million plus. So that's all I have about serious adverse reactions. I would strongly encourage that everyone get their vaccinations this fall.